Parasites from others need to get out. Lisa hurled those words at me. Ignoring my surprise, she continued. This house is under my dad's name, and as his real daughter, I have the right to live here. You're in the way, so could you please leave now? Hearing that, I was momentarily dumbfounded. But I quickly burst into laughter. Do you not know? I deliberately paused there. Lisa, curious about what I would say next, swallowed hard and stared at me intently. I gave instructions to the movers, who seemed troubled, to carry all the items to an empty room for the time being since there wasn't much to move. Amid the confusion, Lisa tried to sneak in, so I stopped her with my hand. This house is in my name. You and I are strangers. Please don't enter without permission. When I said that, Lisa's face turned bright red, and she shouted, I don't care, before storming off somewhere. After Harry passed away, I felt a simmering anger at being treated this way. I was determined to make her regret it. I had finally turned the tables. My name is Gina Smith, I'm 39 years old and work as a piano teacher. My husband Harry was six years older than me and an entrepreneur running his own company. We slowly nurtured our love after meeting through work. When we started considering marriage, Harry confessed something to me. Apparently, he had been married before. He had married his girlfriend at the time in his 20s, and they had a child named Lisa, but soon after, his ex-wife's infidelity came to light. She ended up incurring a significant amount of debt for her lover and even relinquished custody, resulting in Harry gaining custody of Lisa. Lisa, who had grown up in a single-parent family for a while, apparently didn't lack for anything as Harry's company was flourishing. However, as Harry's financial status got better, Lisa's demands became increasingly unreasonable. In middle school, she constantly wanted high-end cosmetics and to dye her hair, and she never listened no matter how many times she was told. Lisa, who grew up spoiled, was very hostile when introduced to me as her father's new partner during her high school years. I don't acknowledge you as a mother. I have a beautiful mom and a rich, kind dad, and that's enough for me. Although Harry never told Lisa about her mother's infidelity, she seemed to greatly admire her mother, who was said to be beautiful. I didn't necessarily think that was bad. In the end, Lisa never accepted me, so we decided to get married after she turned 18, graduated high school, and started working. I thought Lisa had grown into a respectable adult, but I never imagined things would turn out this way. Harry and I never wanted children of our own. For him, Lisa was his only child, and if we were to have a child together, Lisa would say, I can't deal with a half-sibling. And we didn't know what she might do, so that was part of it. Given my age in the late 30s and the stories I heard from people who had kids, I started to feel that I probably wasn't cut out for parenting. Especially when I imagined Lisa, who was openly hostile towards me, and a hypothetical rebellious child of our own. I was certain I couldn't handle it. So we both agreed that we didn't want children and desired to spend a peaceful life together as a couple. Which led to our relationship and eventually marriage. Then, two years ago, after Lisa turned 18 and started working, we got married and were living an ordinary life as a couple. However, our peaceful days came to an end within those two years. Harry was diagnosed with cancer. It was already in the terminal stage, and all we could do was palliative care. The shock left me in a daze, unable to comprehend the prognosis or future treatment plans, and before I knew it. Harry was hospitalized and had started treatment. Even when I returned home, the days without anyone there continued, and I was worn out, yet another person came to add insult to injury. Yes, that person was Lisa. Technically, Lisa was my stepchild since we were married, but since we had never lived together, I didn't feel that strongly about it. It wasn't strange for a daughter to know where her father lived, but somehow, Lisa knew Harry had been diagnosed with cancer and hospitalized. Dad's got cancer, right? Since you're all out of sorts and he can't bear to watch, so he even let me know. Harry must have told her out of concern, but neither Lisa nor I found it amusing. But Lisa seemed to have her own plans and said with a smirk. So, I've decided to move nearby. I have to take care of you since you're so down, and dad needs someone to look after him, right? He'd rather rely on his real daughter than his new wife, wouldn't he? Leaving such provocation behind, she left. I immediately contacted Harry and relayed the conversation to him, to which he apologized, saying, I can't believe Lisa would say such a thing. 
I thought she had grown up, which is why I reached out to her, but instead, I've made you feel uncomfortable. I'm sorry. Harry is not at fault, and I want him to focus solely on his situation right now. Thinking it's not good to make a sick person worry, I said in as cheerful a voice as I could, it's okay, I'll sort things out with her. But honestly, I'm not confident I can achieve that. Especially since I've always felt that parenting wasn't my strong suit, how am I supposed to deal with someone who's openly hostile towards me? Besides, Lisa is nearly 20 years younger than me. I mean, can I, a 39-year-old, really understand Lisa, who is in the prime of her youth at 20? Especially since we're not even related by blood? Such thoughts kept coming and going, leaving my mind in a mess. Thinking about it won't help, so for now, I decided to focus on my work and supporting Harry. With that forced mindset, I tried to sleep. But I ended up worrying about Harry and couldn't sleep at all, and in the days that followed, my students and their parents started expressing their concern. Before I knew it, half a year had passed. During this time, there were no major changes in my work, and Harry was fighting his illness, living each day with all his might. However, there was one concern that remained, and that was Lisa's presence, who had moved nearby six months ago. In these six months, I think I've lost more than 10 pounds. Even now, as I held a baby in my arms, I frowned, wondering why I had to do this. This baby's name is Emma. Believe it or not, she is Lisa's child. So, technically, I am Emma's step-grandmother, but Lisa takes advantage of this and always dumps Emma on me. Six months ago, Lisa, true to her word, moved nearby. I had assumed she was alone, but to my surprise, she brought along Emma, her real daughter. It seems that after graduating from high school at 18, Lisa fell in love with a guy at the nightclub and spent most of her salary on him within half a year. Having heard from Harry that Lisa's mother was similar, it made me think, like mother, like daughter. But Lisa's love was unrequited, and she ended up getting pregnant and quitting her job. Already being willful and problematic, Lisa probably saw this as a convenient excuse to bail. She made a scene in front of the nightclub, received a settlement, and now she seems to be getting regular child support. She decided to have Emma for that reason, but a few months later, she apparently heard about Harry's illness. Unbelievably, Lisa thought this was lucky. After all, dad has a lot of money, and if I suck up to him now, he might leave me a big inheritance. I still remember the shock I felt when I overheard Lisa talking like this to someone on the phone. From the bits of conversation and voice leaking through, I could tell the person on the other end was a man. But it didn't matter who it was. It was clear that Lisa only saw her father as a cash cow. And as his spouse, I have the right to half of the inheritance, which must be an inconvenience for her. I've even seen her consulting with that unknown caller on how a stepmother can renounce her inheritance rights. I couldn't bring myself to tell Harry, who is trying so hard to live, about this conversation. It would be too cruel. So I kept quiet, trying to deal with it by myself. But taking my silence as acquiescence, Lisa began to order me around more and more after she moved in. At first, it was just, I'm going to the bank for a bit, can you watch Emma, and things like that. But then it escalated to, I'm going to visit dad at the hospital, or Emma's father is pestering me to hear about her. He's suddenly missing his daughter now. And she started treating me like a babysitter frequently. Of course, there was no payment involved. As much as she's my step-granddaughter, I couldn't bring myself to ask for money to take care of her. Fearing something might happen to Emma more if I refused. This gradually escalated, and just the other day, Lisa said something like this. I'm going on a trip with friends for about three days, can you look after Emma? You can do it, right? Since you're always at home anyway. Being always at home is only because my piano students come to my house for lessons in the evening. I wanted to say that, but arguing with Lisa only leads to more trouble, so I just agreed. Ironically, I find my granddaughter Emma very cute. I thought I couldn't handle childcare, but babies are indeed adorable, and I felt a tug at my maternal instincts. But at the same time, the thought of her going on a trip gave me a headache. Despite the significant expenses for Harry's treatment every month, taking care of Emma for three days would add even more to the expenses. I've been covering all the costs for Emma's diapers and milk while she's in my care. 
I thought it wasn't right to use Harry's money since I agreed to take care of her, and the burden didn't seem too heavy at first. But as the amount increased, it started to weigh on me. However, when I thought about it calmly, I started to wonder why I, as the grandmother, was doing what Lisa, the mother, should be responsible for. Lisa doesn't acknowledge me as her mother. Yet, I can't deny feeling upset about being used only when it's convenient for her. Still, Emma is innocent in all this, so I did what I could within my limits, but I was reaching my breaking point. I planned to have a serious talk with Lisa when she returned, to tell her to take responsibility and care for Emma herself. But right after Lisa left for her trip, I received a call from the hospital and rushed out of the house in a panic. Upon arriving at the hospital, I realized from the bustling nurses and doctors that Harry's time was near. Emma began to cry as if sensing something was wrong, but the nurses kindly told me not to worry about it. Harry was already unconscious, and it wasn't long before his passing was declared. His face, however, looked peaceful. It's said that hearing is the last sense to go after death, so maybe hearing Emma's cries and my voice helped Harry pass away peacefully. This thought made me break down in tears. The wake and other ceremonies proceeded smoothly, but Lisa was nowhere to be seen. Of course, I informed her of Harry's passing right away, but her response was shocking. Oh, really? But I've extended my trip, so I can't come back right away. Just handle everything as the surviving spouse, nobody will complain. And legally you're his wife, so take care of the rest. And take care of Emma too, she said before hanging up. I wanted to scream in frustration, but I held back for Emma's sake. Harry's relatives did ask why Lisa wasn't there, but I made up a plausible excuse, fearing a commotion if I revealed the truth. Lisa didn't show up even for the burial, leaving me brokenhearted, with only Emma providing some comfort. Lisa disappeared for two weeks after Harry's death, ignoring all attempts to contact her. Then, one day, the doorbell rang, and I found several well-built men at the door, claiming to be movers. Behind them stood Lisa, smiling smugly. Parasites from others need to get out. Lisa blurted that out to me. Ignoring my astonishment, she continued. I've given up my apartment and from today, I'll be living here. After all, this house is in dad's name and as his real daughter. I have the right to live here. You're in the way, so could you please leave now? Hearing this, my face momentarily showed shock, but I quickly burst into laughter. Don't you know? I deliberately left my sentence hanging there. Lisa, eager to hear the rest, swallowed hard and stared intently at me. Accustomed to me, the stepmother, always quietly following her orders, my sudden laughter must have felt more like fear than surprise to her. I gave instructions to the puzzled movers to carry all the items to an empty room for now, since there wasn't much. As Lisa tried to sneak in amidst the confusion, I stopped her with my hand. Do you think it's okay to enter someone else's house without permission? This house is in my name. I haven't adopted you, so technically. We're strangers. And you, more than anyone, don't acknowledge me as your mother. So don't pretend to be my daughter now after using me as a convenient babysitter and looking down on me all this time, I said. Lisa looked frightened by my words. I continued, unfazed, now that your trip is over, I guess it's okay, to return Emma to you. After all, you're her mother. So take proper care of her. Lisa, angry, shouted, I don't care, and stormed off, leaving Emma behind. The movers watched in confusion. Trying to move into my house right after Harry's death, without any communication and insulting me in such a brazen manner, was outrageous. Anger bubbled up inside me. I was determined to make her regret it. I had finally stood up for myself. In the end, Lisa just dumped her stuff in my room and disappeared without a trace. Where she was living or how she was managing was a mystery since she had vacated her apartment. But I was too busy taking care of Emma to think about it. Fortunately, Emma was used to seeing my face since she was a baby and had grown very attached to me since we saw each other almost every day. I had a stock of milk and diapers, and several friends with childcare experience gave me advice after I explained the situation. I had no choice but to accept the situation and do my best. Given the situation, I've decided to take responsibility for Emma's well-being until everything is settled. That was my resolution.
During the lesson at home, Emma fell asleep without crying, probably because the sound of the piano was soothing. But some parents found out about the situation and said that they would watch over her while I was teaching. Information about Lisa somehow leaked, and Harry's relatives would occasionally visit to check on her. When I had to be away for lessons or work. Someone would always step in to watch over her. Although Harry is no longer with us, the support of his connections and the kind-hearted people around me has allowed us to live peacefully. Two months after Lisa disappeared, she suddenly reappeared in front of me. For some reason, a police officer named David and a child welfare officer named Tom were there, claiming I had kidnapped a child. A baseless accusation. Lisa was demanding to David, arrest her already. She took my child. Just because she doesn't have one of her own, how dare, and to Tom. Isn't this your job? Hurry up and take the child back from this woman. I was dumbfounded, but David calmly listened to my side of the story. He seemed a bit incredulous too. It must have dawned on him that Lisa was acting out of spite. Although Tom tried to calm Lisa down, his words fell on deaf ears as her anger reached a boiling point. Realizing we were getting nowhere, I boldly stated. You were the one who pushed Emma onto me. Everyone in the neighborhood knows it, including Harry's relatives. You can't deny it. Especially after you fled that day. And calling the police on me? That might just be obstruction of justice, don't you think? David nodded in agreement. Technically, it might be more accurate to call it filing a false report. After all, Lisa had even filed a complaint to penalize me. But I doubted Lisa would understand the complexities, so I simply told her she was lying and obstructing police duties. Perhaps because she had heard the term obstruction of justice before, Lisa started to falter, showing the impact of those words was significant. I then continued to explain further. I continued, a mother who dumps her infant on someone else to go on a trip or pull stunts like this is the real problem, don't you think, Tom? Turning to Tom, it seemed Lisa finally grasped the situation. Humph, fine, I'll let it go this time. I internally scoffed at her audacity, and David suggested to Lisa that they talk at the station. That was to be expected. After filing a complaint only to reveal it was all a sham, they couldn't just walk away. Lisa, pale-faced, turned to us as Tom added more pressure, sending her into a panic. I'm not to blame. It's all her fault. She continued to spout nonsense, but David and his colleagues greeted me and left the scene. A younger officer came by later for a brief inquiry, but thanks to the testimony of many, my innocence was quickly established. I'm grateful for everyone's support, especially since the police's sudden involvement must have been a shock, but they didn't hesitate to defend me. Lisa was ultimately not prosecuted but received a stern warning. After receiving the police's caution, Lisa became dejected and vanished for about three months. It's about time we decided on Harry's estate inheritance, but since Lisa is his biological child, she will be an heir. So, I need to get in touch with her. However, her whereabouts are unknown, and my attempts to contact her have been ignored, so I hired a private investigator to locate her. And then had experts repeatedly try to contact her. I even had a lawyer send a certified mail and took various measures, but Lisa continued to ignore everything. In the meantime, we marked the first anniversary of Harry's death. Almost concurrently, I received an email from Lisa. The message was simply, stop bothering me, I want nothing to do with this. That's when I went to family court to file for a state division mediation. But since Lisa wouldn't respond, the mediation didn't proceed, and ultimately, the family court had to conduct an estate division trial. And somehow the inheritance matter was concluded. Yet, despite her previous indifference, she showed up at my door complaining about being dissatisfied with the outcome. How can I, his own daughter, not inherit a single penny? This is absurd. She wanted the inheritance without the hassle. She must have assumed that as his daughter, she was entitled to a portion of the estate without question. Yet, upon learning she wouldn't receive anything, she was furious. Her silence was broken only when she realized there was no benefit for her. Her audacity was astounding, but I calmly presented her with the truth. Do you know when the inheritance proceedings began? In response, Lisa confidently replied. That was the day the results came from the family court, right? Hearing her answer, I laughed and said. 
No, that's not it. You knew about your father's death on that very day, so the date of inheritance commencement goes back more than a year. I decided to explain it to Lisa in simpler terms so she could understand. Lisa claims it's unfair she's not receiving her rightful share. But the family court calmly judged based on Harry's will and the circumstances at that time. Firstly, Harry's will stated that he didn't want to give Lisa even a single penny and wished for me to inherit everything. Of course, this alone would infringe upon Lisa's rightful share. So normally Lisa would be entitled to at least half of the inheritance she could receive. However, despite my numerous certified mailings, consultations with experts, and court interventions, Lisa remained silent. Moreover, the decisive factor came when Harry wrote in his will, especially if Lisa abandons the inheritance discussions. I do not want her to have any share at all, leading to me inheriting the entire estate. The fact that I was taking care of Emma, a relative by marriage, also played a significant role. Upon hearing this, Lisa retorted, I took care of a lot when dad was hospitalized. You just took Emma from me and stayed at home. I contributed to dad, so this is unfair. But even against that, I stood firm. Still lying at this stage? After I entrusted her to you, you went out, didn't you? I couldn't believe you'd calmly take care of Harry. So when I called after leaving Emma with you, you weren't there as expected. That's why I ended up taking Emma for clothes changes and such. There's evidence since visitors need to sign in when entering the ward, right? Keeping photos of the visitor logs, which included time and date, proved useful. This also became one of the reasons why the family court ruled in my favor for the full inheritance. Lisa, grinding her teeth in frustration, still tried to find a way, asserting, fine. Then I'll sue for infringing on my rightful share. But, as more than a year had passed since the inheritance began, her right had already expired. Upon hearing this, Lisa, unable to think further, exclaimed, that's a lie. That's cheating. How come I, his own daughter, don't receive a penny of dad's inheritance, and started to panic. Eventually, Lisa slumped in defeat, so I asked, what about Emma? She replied, I can't even take care of myself, let alone a child, and irresponsibly fled. How absurd. I thought, and a few days later, Lisa made her last stand. I want Emma back because she's my child. Despite her previous refusals, her change of heart was puzzling. Indeed, Lisa is Emma's biological mother, and to me, Emma is a grandchild by marriage. Lisa looked triumphant, but I remained calm. Since that trip, you haven't taken Emma back to care for her at all. Don't you have any thoughts on this? Lisa retorted, you wanted to take care of her, not me. I asked Lisa once more, for over a year, you let me take care of your child while you were receiving child support payments, didn't you? Lisa looked puzzled for a moment but then laughed, saying, a mother has the right to receive that, so what's the problem? Hearing this, I smirked. Lisa, surprised by my sudden change in attitude, asked, what's that supposed to mean? I informed Lisa. That means you were receiving child support payments without properly taking care of your child. If this gets out, you'll be subject to penalties and might have to repay. Given that you've caused trouble for the police with your fabrications before, I don't think this will just slide. Lisa's face turned serious. Little did she know, I had recorded our entire conversation. It's set to automatically save to the cloud, so even if Lisa destroys anything, it won't matter. This could lead to charges of property damage, and either way, Lisa will end up in the care of the police. Finally understanding everything, Lisa looked as if she was about to cry and said. You didn't say that, did you? Perhaps she meant whether I had reported this to the authorities. Of course, I reported it, I replied. Lisa's face turned even paler, and she began trembling with her hands over her mouth. No way. It's not a lie. They said they'd investigate, and I offered to provide any evidence I might have. This conversation will also be submitted as evidence. Hearing this, Lisa collapsed on the spot. Apparently out of energy to retaliate, she could only mutter complaints that I couldn't hear. Intending to deliver the final blow, I said. Since I hired a professional to find your whereabouts and sent a certified mail, I know about the boyfriend you're relying on for financial support. You moved in with him after leaving your apartment, 
pretending everything was fine, right? Lisa looked up at me. Not only was it about not raising children, but in cases where someone is helping with living expenses. Receiving child support payments can lead to arrest for fraudulent receipt. Lisa didn't like raising her child alone and moved nearby at the right time after getting a call from the father, pushing Emma onto me. Then, Lisa, who had been fooling around, got a boyfriend, left her apartment, and tried to live with him in my house. Which she attempted to take over. However, since the house was already in my name due to a lifetime gift, that didn't work out. And she probably ended up moving in with her boyfriend by telling him some story. Although it was mostly speculation, seeing Lisa's face again made it seem like all of it was true, as she had a somber look on her face. And then, as if this was her last stand, she said something like this. It's fine, I've realized I need Emma to receive the child support payments, so give her back now. Anyway. It annoys me how happy you seem to be with Emma, so I've come all this way to take her back, she said. Giving a childish reason for wanting Emma back now. I felt a surge of anger towards Lisa, who viewed her child merely as a means to make money, yet I maintained a composed expression and replied. Sure, but shouldn't that conversation happen after discussing it with Emma's father? Ignoring a puzzled Lisa, I turned towards the living room and called out, Ryan, could I have a moment? Frightened by the familiar name, Lisa tried to flee, but unable to muster the strength in her legs, she remained rooted to the spot. Soon, I heard footsteps approaching, and a man appeared, holding a delighted Emma. His name was Ryan, Lisa's ex-husband, and Emma's biological father. I had heard from Lisa that the father at the nightclub had fled due to a lack of responsibility. But I wondered if such a father would really pay alimony and child support regularly. If he was that responsible, he probably would have quit working at nightclub and stayed together. Thinking this, I had a detective investigate Lisa's past for the inheritance case. That led me to Ryan, who turned out to be a regular employee with no past of working at nightclub. Taking a bold step, I mentioned Emma's name and reached out, and he easily agreed to meet. When I brought Emma to see him, Ryan, with tears in his eyes, said. I've finally been able to meet my daughter. I was so happy when you contacted me. The truth is, our divorce was due to Lisa's affair. But she used her position as the mother to take Emma's custody away from me, leaving me to only pay a small amount of child support. As he said this, Ryan's gaze, while holding Emma's small hand, was filled with the love of a true father. This reaffirmed my belief that only parents who truly love and care for Emma should be raising her. Which is why I've consulted child welfare services and the administration about this situation numerous times. Technically, Lisa currently has custody, but it's clear from her actions over the past year that she hasn't been properly raising Emma. Is it really the behavior of a mother to only dump her child on someone she harbors hostility towards when it's convenient? Without even formalizing an adoption? As I kept making appeals, the staff at the administration gradually began to sympathize with Ryan and Emma. I wasn't just working on the inheritance over this past year. I've been thinking about getting Emma back to where she belongs as soon as possible. In the process of handling the inheritance, I paid extra for a lawyer's advice to help Ryan regain custody, all done discreetly. Everything is already in place. Ryan, now 26 and being considered for a promotion to section chief, has no financial issues. There are many who would vouch for Ryan's character and his contributions, and despite Lisa's mistreatment, he has a track record of properly paying both child support and Lisa's living expenses. With this, it's clear who has the upper hand in any custody battle. Lisa, who neglected Emma and pushed her onto the stepmother who found her an inconvenience for her romantic life. Ryan, despite enduring Lisa's treatment, has shown genuine concern and frequently checked on Emma's well-being after learning about the situation. I was aware that Lisa already had issues with fraudulently receiving child support payments, and there were problems with her boyfriend as well. Your current boyfriend is the one working at nightclub, right? The one you were talking on the phone with before. But there's still another man supporting you financially, isn't there? You're drowning in debt from spending too much on them. The financial supporter has also noticed your double life and has left. And your boyfriend from nightclub is about to dump you because he realizes he can't get any more money out of you. Ryan will make a much better and loving father than you, I said, delivering the final blow. My words were the last straw, and Lisa cried out loudly, apologizing deeply. 
Of course, no one forgave her. Finally, Lisa received her comeuppance for treating her own child as a tool for money and using me, the stepmother, and even her ex-husband, Ryan. For her convenience. After some time, with the help of friends, lawyers, and others, the custody battle concluded with Ryan gaining custody of Emma. My acquaintances, the parents of my students, and Harry's relatives asked me if it was really okay. They were probably questioning if it was alright to simply hand over Emma to Ryan just because he is her biological father. Especially after all the hardships I had endured for over a year. Indeed, I struggled with the decision, but I didn't want to keep Emma away from a father who loves her. But first, let me tell you what happened to Lisa. Firstly, it seems Lisa was arrested for the child support issue. Not actually raising the child, the existence of a boyfriend from nightclub, and another man supporting her financially were significant factors. And she was caught for fraud. Eventually, she received a suspended sentence, but then the custody battle erupted, and Lisa was in despair. Unable to escape, and with various evidence and testimonies against her. The judgment was passed to transfer custody to Ryan as the most suitable decision. Afterwards, Lisa lost everything. Including Emma, her boyfriend, the man who supported her financially, and even her own savings and reputation. At that time, it seemed she was working as a temp, which didn't pay well. And her poor work attitude led to her being laid off at the worst possible time. As a result, she lost her job and fell so far as to become homeless. Without a home address, she couldn't find a decent job. And she was repeatedly turned down for live-in part-time positions due to her lack of work history and qualifications. This is truly a case of karma and getting what one deserves. As for me, I was living a modest life without using Harry's inheritance. I believe that Harry probably wanted to share his inheritance with Emma, his granddaughter. However, he must have been afraid of involving Emma by writing that in his will. That's why I always made sure to give Ryan a gift from Harry's inheritance for Emma's special occasions. Ryan, for some reason, recently moved close to me and suddenly confessed his feelings. While visiting Emma, I realized I've fallen in love with you. I didn't say anything because it was a difficult time, but Emma is attached to you. Gina. She sees you as her mother. I know it's disrespectful to you as a widow and to Harry as my father-in-law, but please. Would you become a part of our family? Hearing such words, one can't help but be conscious of the feelings involved. As it turns out, there was more to Harry's will. It wasn't related to the inheritance, but it concluded with this. After I'm gone, if you find someone who loves you, Gina, please be happy with him. Your happiness is my happiness. Harry, usually a man of few words, must have tried his best to convey his feelings through writing. I'm considering what's best for Harry, Ryan, and Emma. Little did I know at the time that I would be attending Emma's elementary school entrance ceremony a few years later.